Hello everyone, today is gonna to be epic because I'm gonna do a video on preload and why it's important, why we have it in bikes, why we have it in all of our bearings and in general industry and everyday life. And I go on about it so much in my wheel videos about how it gives stiffness and good bearing life and stuff, but I've never really explained it. So yeah, we're gonna get onto why it's important and uh, we're actually gonna use this Windspace Gen 1 Hyper as a case study because I was stripping it down today to put some new bearings in and I thought the bearings were a little bit tired and a little bit tight. They're two years old now. I've been running these for pretty much exactly two years. So I thought, good time to replace them with some, a, a new 6903 and a new 6803. And I thought, what a better time to actually measure the, um, the hub tolerances and the axle tolerances to decipher how much preload is on the bearings or not. Anyway, peaktalk.com, you can find out more about me and my stuff. And here's my OnlyFans website uh, where you can get more exclusive, juicy content uh, in a very private uh. manner. So moving on, what is preload and why is it needed? Well, all bearings, at least deep groove ball bearings, which is what we, you know, what we mainly have in bikes, um, have internal clearances. And normally these are stated as radial clearances and you get different classes of bearings, some are tighter, some are looser. But a radial clearance is displacement of the outer ring versus the inner ring. How much the inner ring and outer ring can move in a radial sense, up and down, left and right. Axial clearance is how much the inner race can move with respect to the outer race that way. And a kind of combination of those leads to angular clearance. And it's the angular clearance which gives kind of slop at the edge of the wheel when you're doing a lateral stiffness test or you're cornering or you're sprinting. You want to take those angular clearances out to get a stiff wheel. If you don't have a stiff wheel, you get tire scrub and flex. So you want to take clearances out and you do that with preload. There are other things that preload gives you like absolute positional tolerance. So if you've got two things you want rotating coaxially, but you want to keep the axial position very, very fixed, you want to preload it so you know that the bearing stays in, in the same place, you know, inner and outer race with respect to each other. And I'll show you that an example of that in a minute in industry. Um, reduces the noise, it reduces the vibration and reduces the heat. And overall just improves the bearing life of any bearing. And it does, like I said, maximize the stiffness of the assembly. And we're gonna look at this Windspace Gen 1 Hyper as a, as a good case study to have a look at. Now, before we go any further, I'm gonna show you this example of something I designed a while ago for controlling a DC motor. Now, what we've got here is one plate on the left-hand side, which attaches to the back of the motor. So that spins at many thousands of RPM. And then a stationary part, which holds a PCB, which has a magnetic encoder reader on it. And the spinning part has the magnetic encoder on it. The air gap of a magnetic encoder, this is 12 bit accuracy. This is like 12 bit, this is pretty accurate. You have to control that air gap to like 0.02 millimeters. And if you don't preload the bearing, as the motor spins, that bearing can drift in and out and your encoder's just gonna throw out loads of crap. So you have to preload it to get the bearing running on, on an angle, like an angular contact bearing, and make sure that distance doesn't change for something like this. There are other applications like wheel bearing in cars where there's a bit of float and it doesn't really matter, but some things really need to be held controlled and that's where preload comes into account. And I achieved that by making this very thin um, aluminium flexible diaphragm that got bolted down to a housing with a set distance. And I knew that when I deflected those webs by two millimeters, I knew the spring force because I simulated it. I knew the spring force I was going to get so I could predict actually how much force not only was I taking the clearance out of the bearing, but I could predict the force I was putting on the bearing. So I can factor that into the life of the bearing calc and everything like that. But that's an example of positional tolerance and preload together. And that is done by spring force, basically. Jumping back to the PowerPoint now, I promise you this is going to get even nerdier. So if you're finding it hard right now, well, just dig in and, and keep up, please, because it gets better. Quickly going through it, all bearings have a different clearance class. Normally, in the middle, we call it CN, which is like a nominal clearance bearing. And on the finer clearance side, you've got C1 and C2, C1 being the kind of tightest clearance, the most precision. Actually, clearance and precision are different, and um, I won't get into that right now, but you can have a very um, loose clearance bearing, like a C5, but very high precision. If you have a bearing with a stated radial clearance of, say, 10 microns, in general, the axial clearance that translates to will be about 10 times that in general, but we'll get to a more accurate way of determining that in a minute. And just before we go any further, don't forget to like and subscribe this video. I don't know what the algorithm is, what it does, or if it helps, but makes me feel good. Press the subscribe button. So moving on, how much clearance does a bearing have? Um, and what size bearings have what clearance? Anyway, 
We're assuming that these bearings are CN clearance. Now these are ceramic hybrid steel ball bearings. Now, rumor has it they have a slightly larger nominal clearance, maybe a C3 than a CN, but we're gonna take this as CN just to keep the calc simple. This is a 6,800 series bearing, this one, so we're gonna go with this one. And we can see here that for a nominal ball diameter of 17 millimeters, which this is, the radial clearance in microns is between three and 18 microns. Now that seems like quite a big span, but that's the data we're given with SKF or NSK. That's more or less, they're all the same, pretty much all the same with the brands. Um, and that's again, the picture of how that translates. So how do you take that clearance out of the bearing? So that radial clearance translates into an axial clearance, like we said. So how do you take that out? There are a couple of methods to do it. One is called position preload, and that is literally forcing by mounting condition the inner race to be offset from the outer race. And you can do that with spacers between two bearings, you can do that with shims, or you can do it with a thread. Now the easiest uh, way to see that on a bike is on a Shimano crank set. So you push the cranks in from one side, you put the non-drive side crank on, and you've got that little threaded collar. That is setting the position preload because you're moving that non-drive side crank in to sandwich the inner races together. And that's using those inner races and pushing the clearance out of both bearings. Don't forget, you're not just pushing on the non-drive side one, at the same time, you're essentially pulling the drive side one together and they should equally squish the inner races in together, taking out all the clearances in the bottom bracket bearings and making, making them work like an angular contact bearing on both sides. So you can do that with um, race spacing. So in this case, you would have um, a longer spacer on the on the shoulder and then between the inner races a shorter spacer so when everything's clamped up the inner races come in ever so slightly and here's another example of preload by position this is my wheel bearing on my car with a lot of german rust underneath and i'm just nipping it up and this is a threaded adjuster to clamp the bearings by position a much easier way to do it um, and a more kind of forgiving way to do it in terms of production would be to use a wave spring easy example of this is a sram gxp crank you push the crank in from one side, it's locked to that, and the whole lot is preloaded, both bearings equally, and push it, pushes them under the same preload. Now, there are pros and cons to both approaches, and we'll go through those quickly now without lingering too much. So the position uh, method, where you're literally clamping everything down with different spacing, has a much higher stiffness. That you literally cannot move it. Um, it. has a fixed axial position, which is really good if you're doing things with high precision. But one drawback of the position preload, which is how these work, is it's hard to quantify how much force you've actually put on the bearings once you've taken the clearance out. And normally, the preload for an assembly like this should be about half to one and a half percent of the dynamic load rating of the bearing, which you can find on a chart, but we won't go into that now. And the machining tolerances are absolutely critical because on one hand, if you really mess it up at the one end of the scale, you get no preload and you don't take any clearance out. On the other end of the scale, if you really mess it up, when you clamp the assembly up with the end caps in the fork and everything, you'll deadlock the bearings and the whole lot will bind and there's way too much force on the bearings. Another situation where I wouldn't use position preload is if you've got dissimilar materials for the shaft and the housing. So let's say you've got, in this case, at the top here, an aluminium housing, which gets very, very, very hot. I'm just gonna turn my pointer on. If your bearings are press fit on the outer races into the aluminium housing, if that gets hot, that's gonna expand at a much higher rate and a much higher magnitude than the steel, probably about twice. So if you're working with very, very fine position tolerances, if you get too much expansion on the outer races and not enough on the inner races, you can deadlock the bearings um, just by thermal expansion. So if you've got very, very high temperatures with dissimilar materials, I wouldn't suggest using position preload, but in bikes, we're always riding at ambient, so it's not that much of an issue. So positives about the GXP or the Wavespring uh, constant force. SRAM GXP has been designed by ship bags and now a boot crew. Almost. It doesn't matter how hot the housing gets, how much it shrinks, how much the, the kind of positions change relative to each other. With the Wavespring, it's very forgiving. You've always got pretty much a constant force. You never get any thermal locking because the whole lot can slide. Um, the machining tolerances of the shoulders and stuff are completely not critical because again, the Wavespring will take that out in its you know, distance of compression. And it's very easy to measure the force of preload because you know if you're compressing the spring by two millimeters, it's very easy to measure the spring force at two millimeters, just a quick test. Uh, the downsize is not very stiff in kind of axial sense. And uh, if you overcome that spring force, preloading the whole assembly one way, you can actually push the whole assembly through the bearing clearances. So it's not very stiff. If you've got really high axial thrust loads, I wouldn't use it. So to take out those bearing clearances, what should 
the machined bearing spacing be? We can't just say, oh, it's going to be 55 for the outer races and 55 for the inner races, because then you're not going to get any preload. The bearings will be sitting in the middle of their kind of travel, actually, and they'll be noisy, they'll have a low bearing life, and you'll get S-shaped kind of tracks uh, in the races as they kind of wander, and the wheel won't be very stiff. Now the hub shell is massively simplified, but all the dimensions and tolerances are, are exact. I've measured it with calipers, I've measured the whole lot with calipers and drawn it up. So how far away should the shoulders on the inner race be spaced and how far away from each other should the shoulders for the outer race be spaced to set the correct preload for this hub? First of all, now this gets really geeky. Like I said, if you've got a known radial clearance in a bearing, pretty much you can times that by 10 to get the axial clearance, but that's not very accurate. That's just a kind of rule of thumb. What you can use is a chart like this, and I'll show you how to use it. It looks complicated, but actually if we take it step by step, it's not that hard. And you can see, again, the diagram at the bottom just telling you what axial clearance is. So to start off, we need to figure out what the radial clearance is. And from that table earlier, let's just hop back. We know that it's between 3 and 18 uh, microns radial clearance. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take something around in the middle, so 10 microns. Okay? I'm going to take that as a random middle, middle position. Going back to the table, so we've got, okay, we're not going to use the 6.9, we're going to use the 6.803 bearing. So we're going to find out the axial clearance for this based upon the radial clearance, okay? So we know the radial clearance, we've just said, is 10 microns. For a 6,800 series bearing, we're looking at graph 9 and line B. And then we start on the x-axis here at 10 microns radial clearance, because we picked that from the earlier chart. We draw up to line 9. Next step, we draw across to line B, which then gives us a 12 degree contact angle. So we know when, when we're preloading these and we've taken the clearance out, the uh, contact angle of the ball is going to be 12 degrees. We then draw down again to line B, we draw across to line 9, and then we go up to find out the axial clearance on the x-axis again. We can see that that gives us 100 microns of axial clearance in this 6803 if it's a CN bearing. And that's how you use these charts. Pretty cool, really, really cool, whoever formulated this. 0.1 of a millimetre, axial slop. Now, if I put my finger in it, when I put the wheel in the bike and I twisted the wheel at the outer, put some side load on the wheel, I would feel that as a big amplified displacement at the edge of the wheel. So that's why we need to preload it. If we've got two of these, kind of shoulder difference between the inner and the outer races should be 0.2 if you want to take all that clearance out. Now I've measured this shaft, and I'll drop in a clip here. It measures between the inner race shoulders 55.1. And I kid you not, I've measured the shoulder distance at 54.91. And you can kind of see me doing it here. Now, yes, using a caliper to do height gauge measurements, I promise you I took that measurement like 10 or 15 times trying to take an average of all the measurements I got, and it was 54. 0.91. So our total for the position offset was 0.19, which I measured. And don't forget our target, our theoretical target for these bearings was 0.2. So is that a fluke? Is that a coincidence? Or are we absolutely bang on wind space? Like have wind space nailed that to like 10 microns to do that? Like that's incredible. Does it explain why these wheels are so stiff out of plane because they've absolutely nailed the preload? Maybe. Let me just show you on another schematic how that looks. So here I've got an assembly drawing uh, of what we've just measured basically. So we've got the axle, the shoulders on the axle at 55.1. That's what I measured directly. That's pretty easy and pretty reliable to measure that on the calipers. It's just a linear displacement. And then the shoulders on the hub are measured at 54.91. So the shoulders on the hub are slightly further in than the shoulders on the axle. So that's just going to put those bearings running on their angle and take out the inner races a little bit wider. Fine. Have they nailed it? Because don't forget, we were looking at 0.1 each, so 0.2 total. Almost incredible. So they've got the displacement right. But in my opinion, it's the wrong way around. Suggest if you think I've got this wrong. I'm pretty sure I've done this correctly. I've worked for 10 years in the industry doing rotating machinery. So I think I know what I'm doing. But depending on how you arrange the bearings to run on the angle, you can get a different angular stiffness of the whole assembly. Yes. They've taken all of the bearing clearances out, which makes a very, very stiff wheel. Kudos to them. By coincidence or by good engineering, bang on. But, so I double, double, double checked, or double, double, eight times, um, the, the, the length of this. And I couldn't believe the length of this shoulder was longer than the hub spacing in the hub shell. 
because what that does is push the inner races out. So I'll show you a quick schematic. Because they've made this longer than the, the hub shell, the inner races are being pushed outwards. And that's fine, but they could have made it better by making the inner race shoulders closer together than the hub shell, because then they would have got this. When everything is clamped up by the end caps and the through axle and the fork, that the inner races are pinched in slightly. And what that does is it puts the bearings from that angle to that angle and makes the resistant moment arm uh, a little bit better. It makes it a little bit uh, stiffer in, in out of plane moments. And, and it was also better for axial loads as well. So kind of cornering or a mixture between cornering and sprinting and lateral, lateral loads. Um, this is what we call a back-to-back -back arrangement and the previous one would be called a face-to-face -face arrangement and face-to-face -face arrangements are a little bit better for taking out angular misalignment they're a little bit more forgiving for tolerance mismatch but if you want stiffness you would go from a back-to-back -back arrangement like this now these aren't angular contact bearings but when they're preloaded they kind of work on an angle so they kind of become an angular contact bearing and if you want them to be in the stiffest way possible laterally you put them on that angle, not that angle, because you get an improved resistance moment arm. Anyway, that would be my only suggestion to win space. There's a 21.5% chance I may have fucked up the measurements because I don't have my height gauge, but like I said, I measured it about 15, 20 times to make sure I was doing it right, and I was still surprised that that nominally is 55.1, and that one is 54.9, and not the other way around, because if it was the other way around, you would have got a stiffer hub and a stiffer wheel. I'm going even deeper into this rabbit hole, just a little addendum. Obviously, I've already put on the screen, this is how the Hyper Gen 1 is actually as measured. Um, they may have changed it from the later ones, the Gen 2. I haven't stripped those down yet, so I don't know, but this is what I've got on the Gen 1s. Now, let me just put my pen on. Pen is, no, we won't bother with that. All right, anyway, now, Another problem with having the inner tube, so the axle kind of longer than the housing, which is shorter in this case, is we've mentioned that you're pushing the inner races outwards like this. Sorry for my crap drawing skills. We're pushing the inner races outwards. Now, that's fine. You can do that to take up the bearing clearance. You're gonna get this slightly reduced kind of resistance arm, moment resistance arm like I've mentioned. But by pushing the bearings outwards like this, you also have a load path going through the bearing like that. So you're pushing the inner race and obviously you've got this contact angle and the contact points, but you're also actually pushing on the outer race as well. Now that's fine if this bearing fit is very, very stiff like that on all these outers. But what happens if the bearing fit becomes loose or what is mounted on here? Yes, a massive disc brake which goes up to about 300 degrees. If this hub shell gets hot, even by a slight amount, and you lose your bearing fit in there, um, because you've got this low path and this constant outwards pressure, you could actually get the outer race kind of walking out of its seat. And if it walks out by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 microns, you've lost all the preload on that bearing then, and then your bearing life is gonna suffer. So this is another reason why I think they should do it like this schematic, um, to push all the inners this way because if you do that, the resultant kind of bearing preload, uh, the load path from the end cap, don't forget the end cap comes on here and pushes on the inner races, pushes all the inner races inwards, then your load path is like this, right? And no matter how much you pinch the inners inwards, you're also applying an inward force to the outers, which is always gonna keep them up against the seat. Uh, and I think that's a better way of doing it. And you get this slightly stiffer setup from, from the, the axial loads because of this moment on. Anyway, um, going back to this, they, this is valid, but what they're missing is a uh, circlip. If you're gonna do it like this, you need to restrain the outer races with circlips all around. Now, if you look in a machinery kind of build guide um, or engine engineering reference guide, they would tell you to restrain it like this or in a bearing book. If you're preloading the inners that way, you need to restrain the outers. So no matter how hot the housing gets, that they can't wander and they can't start to walk because then you'll lose preload. Anyway, that was a massive addendum. Um, I don't know how they're doing on the latest hypers. They have changed the axle. It is all anodized, so maybe they've improved it, but time will tell when I strip the next ones down. Please let me know in the comments and I can't wait to talk more on this in the future. So cheers, see you in the next one. Don't forget to 
hit me up on Patreon where you can find more of my OnlyFans content and all my aero testing that I'm doing with Aerolab for all these different wheels is going on there, first of all, and all my aero diary. So every time I go out testing on a day where I'm doing loads of testing one day, I'm making a little vlog, a little diary, that's going on to Patreon. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, it's really nerdy, hit me up there. I'll leave a link in the description below. Cheers, see you next one.